Good morning, YouTube. In today's video, we're gonna be doing something a lot differently than I've done in the past. We're gonna be reviewing images from the Apple iPhone 14 Pro and comparing them to the images of the exact same composition from my Canon 5DSR. And then we're going to make a large print from the iPhone file to just see what you can expect from your iPhone images. Now, the reason I'm making this video is not because I set out to replace my DSLR with an iPhone. And to be very clear, that's just not going to happen. What happened was my droid of five years of mediocre service finally met its demise and it was time for a replacement, so I went out to buy a new phone. Now, in the process of researching phones, I saw that the iPhone 14 Pro had 48 megapixels. I immediately scoffed at this because I'm so sick of hearing these wild claims from manufacturers of DSLRs, mirrorless, and phones about the types of images they can produce. I was skeptical, but I figured I need a new phone anyway, I might as well give it a shot. Now, again, to be clear, I'm not trying to make this video to say that the iPhone is comparable to a 50 megapixel DSLR, it's not. The 48 megapixels is only available using the 1X lens, so it's extremely limiting, but even still, I was a skeptic and I was wrong. I was blown away by the quality of these files, and I think you're going to be too. But that's enough jibber jabber. Let's go ahead and hop on the computer so I can show you the files and then we'll make a print. And then afterwards, I'm gonna come back and talk about how I feel about these results and what I think this might mean for landscape photography as a whole. I have two images pulled up on the screen here. The image on the left is the one taken with the iPhone Pro 14 and the image on the right was taken with my Canon 5DSR. Now the Canon 5DSR has about 50 megapixels compared to the 48 megapixels of the iPhone. Now, the other thing I wanna point out is that the iPhone shoots in a four by three aspect ratio compared to the two by three, which is standard for DSLRs. If you prefer this type of aspect ratio or even a 16 by nine, you can expect to have to crop considerable number of pixels from your iPhone image. Now what I have done is I imported these both as raw images and then edited them to be as close as possible to each other. There could still be some fine edits here. It looks to me like the iPhone image is slightly greener and slightly warmer than the 5DSR image, but overall it'll be enough for us to compare. What I wanna do in this view here is show you the difference in resolution. Now, the iPhone was shot at f1.8 in one 110th of a second, which I don't even know if that's an available shutter speed for the Canon, and ISO 125. The Canon, on the other hand, was shot at F9, ISO 200, and was a shutter speed of one fifth of a second. So the first thing I wanna call out is that in the grasses here, because it was such a windy day, you'll see that the grass is blowing everywhere in the DSLR image at one fifth of a second and is much, much sharper at one 110th of a second. There has been no noise uh, reduction or sharpening applied to the Canon 5 DSR. And it does appear that even though these are considered raw images from the uh, iPhone, they do definitely apply some type of noise reduction and sharpening, which will be more obvious when we get to the top of the image. For both images, I focused right here on this rock. You will see that the rock here looks fantastic. And I would say the details actually look better on the iPhone image than they do on the Canon. Additionally, when we look in the water, you can see that even at ISO 200, there's already some noise showing up in the Canon image. The iPhone image has no noise anywhere that I was able to find. Even zoomed into 100%, I can't see any noise on the iPhone image. Now, once we move away from the area that I focused and go towards the sky, that's where the iPhone image starts to fall apart for me. When we look at these peaks here, you can see that there is a considerable amount of sharpening and there are some artifacts and there's this weird halo going around the top of the peaks, which is a key indicator that it's been over sharpened. What bothers me about the iPhone is that it applies this sharpening in camera and there's nothing that you can do about it. I would actually rather have these peaks be soft and not detailed rather than looking like this over sharpened mess because <laughs> It has applied way more sharpening to these highlights than it has to the shadows, and it makes it look even more strange. So when I zoom in to 100%, you can see that here. Look at the details and the highlights and how much sharpening has been applied versus the shadows here and how soft these look. It looks very, very strange. Now, I know you would never zoom in like that at this zoom. That would be completely unreasonable to try with a cell phone image. When we zoom out to 33.3%, however, which this still would be a massive print. This would be about three feet, uh, at least three feet wide. 
The sharpening and the halos around the peaks are so obvious to me, I really can't stand it. I wish that there was the option to not have this sharpening applied and do the sharpening myself. That is the only complaint, however, that I would have on this image. The details look fantastic, the dynamic range is incredible. Outside of that over sharpening of the furthest points, I really, I'm absolutely astonished at how good of a job the iPhone has done. I, if I could go back and redo this, all I would do was shoot one for the foreground, one for the midground, one for the peaks, and do a focus stack. And I think I would have no problem printing this at two feet by three foot, which is what you would expect from a 48 megapixel camera. I should point out that both of these images were captured using a tripod just to make sure I was giving a fair representation. However, I shot the same image for the iPhone with and without a tripod, and they were completely indistinguishable. Now this isn't surprising given that the iPhone is designed to be used handheld, but I can't stress enough how big of an advantage this is and how I can see why folks would want to adopt an iPhone over carrying a DSLR. If I were only posting to social media and not making large prints, I would be more than happy with these results and I would have no need to be carrying a DSLR. Now let's get to the parts where the DSLR obviously outperforms. For one, with the iPhone you cannot control your shutter speed and aperture. Don't ask me why, because my five-year-old droid was able to do this. I don't know why iPhone removed this feature. There are third-party apps that will allow you to do it, but it seems when you use the third-party apps, you don't get the full resolution and it shoots at that 12 megapixel version. If anybody has found a third-party app that allows you to control shutter speed and aperture and still shoot in that full 48 megapixel mode, let me know because I have purchased apps and then when I pull the computer files, they're nowhere near the same resolution. Now that becomes obvious when we get to the corners of the image here. You can see that the details in the iPhone go soft, even with that sharpening applied, versus the DSLR were still tack sharp. Now would these be as sharp as the DSLR if they're f F9? I have no idea. I would assume that they would be considerably sharper, but I don't know if the edge-to-edge -edge sharpness would be as good in the iPhone. The difference in sharpness is going to be most obvious when we go into this top left corner here. When I zoom in to 100%, you can see this DSLR image on the right has much better sharpness in that top left corner than the iPhone does. So I think we've shown that the resolution on these iPhone images is outstanding. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> I, I was very skeptical of the 48 megapixel sensor in the iPhone and I figured it would just be a marketing gimmick and that when we looked at the files, they were gonna look like crap. I'm absolutely astonished at just how good these files are. I do want to call out that there is more work to be done to get to this level and it's not as simple as you might think as taking an iPhone image and it's going to look the way it does on your screen. So let's go ahead and look at that raw DNG file from the iPhone. This is the iPhone image that we were just looking at after my edits have been applied. Now if we go back to the actual raw DNG file, this is what we would have gotten. Now this gives you a good idea of the level of dynamic range on this sensor. This is pretty incredible. If we bring this all the way down, we can see that we have all of our highlight detail. And if we go all the way up three stops, all this shadow detail has been fully recovered. And again, there's no noise in this file whatsoever. So either this sensor is just absolutely incredible or more likely there is some AI powered noise reduction software running in the background as you take images, which are then baked into the file. This is not what it looks like on your phone when you take an image. This is the raw image that's in the background. Apple applies this Apple Pro Raw profile. This is what you will see on your phone screen. Now on my phone screen, this looks great with the backlit 4K whatever display. Everything looks fantastic. However, when I got it on the computer, I just thought it looked terrible. <laughs> the shadow detail here uh, in the peaks has gotten very muddy. There's very little contrast and to me the light on these peaks just looks a little bit cartoonish. This is bright orange uh, and although the light that morning and you'll see in the video in a couple of weeks we did have this blood red color on the peaks for a little while but by the time we got to this point of the day, um, that light had mostly faded. And what we actually had was the more pale yellow color um, that you saw in the previous edits. Now what I wanna call out is when you look at the histogram here, you can see that they've opened the shadows all the way and that they've clamped down the highlights, essentially just giving you all the detail possible in a very flat file. 
From here, you could apply edits and work on the file, but you could see we've lost some of this information. It almost feels like I'm working with a JPEG uh, when I apply this profile. As soon as I start moving these sliders, you see the details get very muddy and it just, it looks very, very bad. <laughs> so if you plan on doing any edits, make sure that when you download the files, you download them as the full DNG and you don't apply the Apple Pro Raw profile. But okay, I think we've gotten a good idea of how good these files look on the computer, but let's go ahead and make some prints. Because for me, if I'm going to be willing to take images with an iPhone, I wanna make sure that I can actually use them for more than just looking at them on a screen. This is a 24 by 32 roughly print. I'll put the actual dimensions up on the screen. I originally made a 15 by 20 print on some cheap Canon paper thinking that it was gonna be enough to show the quality. Uh, and I could see even on that that the print was worth more. So I put this on a Hanamule bamboo paper. Um, and I'm, I have to say from about three or four feet, this print is perfect. I can't really see any flaws. Even still, I can, I can see the haloing yeah, even from about three feet away. But as I come in closer, that's where all the flaws I talked about earlier become very obvious. So it really depends on how you view your prints. If you're the type of person who's going to put them on a wall in appropriate viewing distance, this is a fantastic print and I would have no issues hanging it in my house. Would I sell this to a client? No, and definitely not. Um, like I said, the corner sharpness is really bad as we get up close. It's just like it was on the monitor. It's, it's not quite right. And again, this haloing here uh, on the edge is really bad. To me, it looks like a sky replacement where the sky was put in after on an overblown sky where you get that kind of halo around the edges. That's what I would think if I saw this. I would think that they just did a sky replacement, did a really poor job. And then again, the corners here, they're just a little bit soft and there is some um, chromatic aberration as well. With that said, this is a nearly two foot by three foot cell phone image printed very large and it just, I, I have no words. I'm blown away by the quality of this. When I went to make this video, I thought we'd be lucky to get an eight by 10. Um, and I do think that I will probably be finishing this print and putting it on the wall just so that I don't waste the paper because the quality really is, um, it's just a fantastic print overall. Even when we get very close to these details here in the rock, it just looks fantastic. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Even, even if you got your nose all the way up to this grass or the rock, you'd have no issues. Towards the mid-ground, you'll start to see some of that softness like we discussed earlier. I'd say this is even acceptable, um, even getting up close to the print. Again, it's really not till we get to the back that it just becomes unacceptable to me. This, um, this is really just, it looks cartoonish, it's, it's pretty bad. Let me know in the comments what you think about the print and whether or not you think this is an acceptable print uh, at this size, given that's a single image not even stitched or um, exposure blended or focus stacked or any of that, which would obviously only improve the quality. If you had this on a tripod and could shoot multiple exposures, um, I think you could obviously get an even better result. Okay, so hopefully the results came through on the prints. Um, I know that looking through a phone, also filmed on the iPhone because, you know, why not? Um, it could be a little bit difficult to really appreciate a print through a screen, but I did the best that I could and hopefully those results come through clearly. Uh, I have to say, I don't know how I feel about this yet. <laughs> um, is it a good thing that in your pocket at any time as a landscape photographer, if you happen upon a scene, you're able to capture it in incredible detail and make a usable image? Absolutely. I did not intend to make this video. Uh, as I was packing up, uh, I remembered, oh shoot, I haven't captured a photo to send to the folks back home, so I'll just snap a picture on my phone. And it looked really good. And then I remembered the 48 megapixel thing, so I put it on the tripod, took a photo, put my camera on the tripod, take the same photo so I can compare when I get home. I didn't expect that the results would be this good, and I definitely didn't expect to be making a video to talk about it. But at the end of the day, the best camera that you have is the one you have with you, and I carry my phone everywhere I go. So this is going to be a good thing for me to always have a usable camera with me. Now, what does that mean for photography as a whole? That's a whole nother question and probably something that I can make a whole video on in the future, and I probably need some time to think about it. But what I do know now is that I believe it's software that is growing exponentially compared to hardware. 
Now, I could be wrong, I'm not an expert in this field by any means, but I don't believe that Apple is making better lenses than Zeiss, Nikon, and Canon and Fuji, nor do I believe that their sensors are better. What I can believe is that Apple has excellent software and is able to create a device that allows you to just press one button and it does everything else for you because that is their market. They want something that's foolproof, you just click a button and you're done. Does that mean that manufacturers like Canon, Fuji, Nikon, etc., will focus more on software in the future? I don't know. In a lot of ways, I hope that they do because I think that there is a good use case for it. Perfect example is focus stacking. I know a lot of manufacturers are doing that in camera now, exposure blending to increase dynamic range. There are a lot of ways that I think this type of software could be great for camera manufacturers. Where do I think it could be an issue? With AI, you can already see uh, websites and such where you could type in things and it'll create an image for you. I can see in the next three to five years being able to hold up an iPhone, point it at something like Half Dome, type in the time of day that you'd want, say sunset image with snow falling, hit a button and it will create a beautiful scene for you. Hell, you probably don't even have to be looking at Half Dome. You could probably just put that into the software and it'll make an amazing image that nobody could look at and know whether it came from a photographer with a DSLR or a phone or an AI program. That's kind of what worries me as I see this shift towards AI and these types of things. Now, do I think that's gonna devalue photography? I don't think so. Uh, people have been saying that for years that the more images come out, the more saturated the photography world is and the less photos are worth. Clyde Butcher's still out there with a wooden box doing very well for himself. So I really think that the art of photography and the craftsman that is the photographer will always be critical but I do think it's gonna be more challenging. Uh, and the reason I say that is you look even today, photographers will go to the same location 20 times to get great conditions. They get that shot and the first thing people will say is, is that Photoshopped? And I get it because I do that too. Like I said, if I saw this image from this phone, I would be like, oh, you did a sky replacement. It looks like crap. That's why you have that halo around the ridge. I get the skepticism uh, because there are a lot of photographers who will do stupid crap. Like, I don't know, put a moon in front of clouds and try to pass it off as reality. And that does cheapen the reputation of photography as a whole. And it's interesting too, because photography used to be the medium that was real, right? You would take a picture on the negative and it was what it was. Those days are gone. Um, I think there's pros and cons to that, of course. A pro, perfect example, is content to wear fill. If I shoot a negative, uh, rather than sitting there and trying to meticulously fix dust spots, software could do it for me very quickly and it does a fantastic job. So. Who knows what the future of photography looks like, but I do know that things like this are going to change the landscape of photography community massively. Uh, it'll lower the barrier to entry, which is a good thing. I think more photographers is a positive thing overall. But I do worry about what it's going to mean in terms of how important the photographer is in the image and how much it is the software engineers at Apple. But that's enough for that. We'll make a whole nother video in the future as we learn more. <laughs> Hopefully the machines haven't taken over, I don't know. Ugh. This video is exhausting, I have to tell you. I, I didn't wanna make this video and then I saw the results and I felt like I had to make the video in case other folks were thinking about getting this phone and just wanna know the quality of the images. And I saw the damn quality of the images and now I'm having an existential crisis about everything I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know, we'll see. My thoughts will continue to evolve, I'll let you know. But I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. What did you think about the results? Did they surprise you? Uh, do you think you would use an iPhone or similar phones? I'm sure other uh, phones are excellent as well. Um, and just overall with AI software, what are your thoughts on how it's going to impact photography? But that's all I've got. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Get out there, make some images.